Hi, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's edition of the Oncology Data Advisor Fellows Forum. Today, we are celebrating Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month. I'm joined today by Dr. Sitharamu from Northwell LIJ and Dr. Hadfield from Brown University. Nice to see you all today. Always good to see you, too. Thank you. Awesome. So today we'll be discussing a very important tumor, and I say important because of kind of interesting um, trends in epidemiology as well as treatment strategies, and that is head and neck uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma predominantly. Um, would you folks like to tell us a little bit about the epidemiology of this disease, please? Yeah, sure. So, you know, head and neck uh, cancer is is quite prevalent in our country. Uh, in the United States and worldwide, um, you know, 54,000-ish new cases per year uh, with around 11,000 deaths per year. So a uh, pretty significant um, amount of patients being diagnosed and, and treated for this each, uh, each year. So uh, a, a pretty big burden uh, on the uh, oncology community for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, much more prevalent in other countries uh, than it is here. But I think the changing epidemiology is really about the HPV driven tumors, which I'm sure we'll be talking about in a little bit. Uh, but I've also started seeing, and I think it's a global um, uh, recognition that um, individuals with uh, no tobacco use history uh, are increasingly being diagnosed with oral cancers. And I think we're still trying to uh, find out the reason for that, that that's also something that's evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely uh, concerning epidemiologic trends. Um, and I also wanted to correct myself. I was limiting us to the squamous cell carcinoma subtypes. So really, we should be more inclusive. Think about things like nasopharyngeal cancers and how they have a little bit of a differences in a geographic distribution as well. But yes, certainly a, a unique subset of diseases when we're considering among the other types of solid tumors. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the pathway of diagnostics and how we arrive at the diagnosis of any of these head and neck cancers? Um, I, I can take that. I mean, it, it is um, um, a lot of times, unfortunately, still patient driven. We do not have any great screening um, processes for head and neck cancers, um, though there are some, um, you know, many institutions institutions have screening programs, but we don't have really a clear, not like, you know, unlike low dose CT for uh, lung cancer, mammogram for breast cancer, we do not have that um, uh, uh, a, a clear defined uh, screening pathway in some epidemic areas. Uh, for example, in um, Asian countries, there, there, there are some um, places where they do uh, screening for nasopharyngeal cancer where, where it's very prevalent, um, but we do not have that. We do not have high risk group of uh, individuals that we can screen for or a blood test that would tell us who would be at higher risk. I think that's an area of interest and I, I think that's something that um, that needs to uh, you know be focused on in the upcoming years uh, also dental evaluation you know uh, the role of uh, uh, our dental medicine colleagues in diagnosing oral cancers referring them appropriately to oral surgery or to uh, to head and neck surgeons um, for further workup um, would you know these are all important things and i think every little things you know matter um with regards to the diagnostic process in general, I mean, usually um, patients are channeled through, uh, you know, local um, ENT doctors through to head and neck surgery. And then um, depending on what is found during um, uh, a nasal, um, you know, endoscopic exam or um, uh, a DL, uh, a direct laryngoscopy uh, patients are, you know, uh, depending on the diagnosis, they're further directed towards different diagnostic processes. Um, we've also started using some blood-based markers um, recently in the, uh, to help us aid, uh, with the diagnostic process. And that's, that's uh, a very interesting area of development as well within the last couple of years. You know, I think you made a lot of really important points there. I want to try to highlight a few of them. Um, the first is, as you mentioned, at least in the United States, no really approved screening methods. Although, like you said, 
for folks who have a lot of tobacco use, for instance, we'll often see low dose CT being used for other uh, purposes, right? Looking for things like lung cancers. We know that folks with head and neck cancers, especially those that are related to tobacco, have a higher rate of secondary lung cancers as well. So that's definitely an opportunity for greater growth. The other one, which has really uh, picked my interest, is that thought of a blood based. Um, screening tests. I mean, we have similar sort of tumor markers when we're looking at rarer types like Merkel cell carcinoma, looking at polyoma virus, viral loads, and that sort of thing. I would love to see an assay one day about HPV, DNA positivity, et cetera, being used in this space. So something we should really look forward to for sure. I'm curious if either of you have uh, integrated EBV into, um, you know, the, these patients, because that, that's something that, you know, I, I know is, is much more common in other more endemic areas, but not so much here in the United States. Um, I mean, I typically, if, if there's a nasopharyngeal cancer, I typically use um, the EBV DNA titers to, to not only um, help ascertain the disease burden, but also as a biomarker for response. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, in patients with uh, unknown primaries, you know, presenting with, you know, lymphadenopathy in the neck, um, of course, our pathologists do due diligence in trying to uh, get, e you know, they do the EBER stain as well as the HPV markers. But sometimes the quantity is not sufficient or the tumor is very necrotic in which when uh, during which times I have used EBV as a surrogate marker um, mm -hmm. to help aid in diagnosis, but not not really as a screening method by no means. Right. Right. Definitely interesting approaches for anyone uh, listening who might be interested in that uh, moving forward, for sure. Um, all right. Why don't we switch gears a little bit? Um, let's talk a little bit about the treatment paradigm for head and neck cancers and any updates in such paradigms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, from, you know, typically for head and neck cancers, you know, you're, you're using a combination of chemo chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And I, I think now we're we're starting, as with other uh, solid tumor malignancies, have started using um, immune checkpoint inhibitors in certain patient populations, particularly those that have high CPS scores. Um, but uh, I don't think, you know, we had a really interesting conversation yesterday about um, esophageal cancer. And I, I don't think immunotherapy has made quite the advancements in, um, in uh, head and neck cancer as it has in others. I, I think we, we need to think about more therapeutic strategies to, to try and augment uh, just chemo RT. Although chemo RT, to be fair, is is quite effective, but it is such a a challenging treatment paradigm for patients to get through, as I'm sure you both know and have have experienced. And it, um, it really is a a very very challenging uh, treatment course, uh, even when uh, curative intent is possible. Yeah, I agree. I think um, you know you would imagine that. I mean, it's a very immune rich field, right? I mean, it is. You know, there's a lot of immune cells, but then. You know there is this immune desert. There's there's a lot a lot of T Rex and other um, uh, immune cells that you know um, uh, cells that that really should clear the way for the ones that are effective. So I think there are some strategies around that to improve the immune response to uh, to these tumors. Um, but um, but I think the other field that's evolving is also de-escalation strategies. Just again, uh, piggybacking of of um, the uh, morbidity involved in um, treatment of head and neck cancers. You know, concurrent chemo radiation has really no, not been much of a, a movement. We still use cisplatin, which is extremely difficult to tolerate. You know, with the cumulative toxicities that remain beyond the treatment. Um, so. There's, there's obviously a need for improvised strategies, but we don't have anything as of yet. Um, you know, we thought cetuximab was going to be that holy grail, but we know that that is now inferior. Um, with regards to the de-escalation strategies, I mean, none of them really have stood out, um, but I, uh, I usually do not uh, offer de-escalation strategies outside of uh, clinical trial context. But that is something, you know, the biomarkers, the CTDNA, use in, uh, in, in, in kind of ascertaining who would benefit from this de-escalating strategies is extremely beneficial. Um, and that's something that I look forward to in the upcoming years. We really need less morbid uh, treatments. 
Yeah, Dr. Sitarum, I think that's a really important point um, because we're seeing a lot of strides in related malignancies, breast cancer, et cetera, where de-escalation is having a lot of attention and success, but uh, certainly we can see and hope for a greater success in the head and neck space as well. You know, Dr. Hadfield and I were just at the AACR meeting uh, that took place last week. And one of the sessions that I was very interested in was looking at novel treatment combinations in head and neck uh, cancers. For instance, looking at things like cetuximab and PD-1 inhibitors combined are there any sorts of uh, treatment combinations or rationales that are upcoming that you're looking forward to seeing either in a clinical trial or elsewhere? Um, well, I think, like, you know, there are definitely, um, that that's one strategy. I think using TKIs along with um, immunotherapy is another one. I, majority of the studies are really uh, looking to... Um, to improve the access uh, of immune cells uh, to the um, to to the uh, tumor, um, and um, again, dual immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. You know that that's another area of uh, of interest. There are a lot of um, intratumoral injections uh, combined with uh, um, checkpoint inhibitors intravenously. So those are all interesting combina you know interesting combinations that I'm sure there, there are a multitude of combinations that are being evaluated um, all interesting uh, concepts but um, would like to see which of these will hit the finish line yeah definitely we'll, we'll all be waiting with our fingers crossed for sure um, yeah. I, I especially like the idea of intratumoral injections especially if there's like that one resistant node or something to that degree um, so yeah we'll see how that goes yeah I think also integrating, uh, yeah no, go ahead. Sorry. No, also integrating radiation technologies, you know, along with immunotherapy. That's another area of hot um, research. Perfect. Um, okay, so we know that there's a lot more to uh, discover as it comes to the treatment paradigm, and we wait for that. Um, why don't we go ahead and wrap up our discussion today by talking about some survivorship topics as they relate to head and neck cancers. And I'll start us off. I think um, one really important piece to consider when discussing head and neck cancer awareness month is really the critical nature of HPV vaccination and access to vaccinations. We know that this is one of the major global health goals sponsored by lots of international organizations to really increase that access. We know there are a lot of barriers to that. It's not just supply chain issues, but also a lot of things related to health literacy, government support, et cetera. And this is just a moment to keep in mind that HPV uh, vaccine access, at least in the United States, is relatively available. It's just a matter of making sure folks are aware of it and able to get funneled into it correctly in the right age groups, but we really have to be advocates to make sure that the access to these uh, essentially preventive therapies entirely for cancers of the head and neck and of the cervix, et cetera, can be accessed. So that's just one topic to kind of start our conversation about survivorship. Yeah, those are some phenomenal points. I, I think, um, you know, it, it also piggybacks really well off the conversation we had yesterday that, um, you know, the point that you brought up that prevention uh, is so, so important uh, when you think about these types of cancers that are um, oncovirus driven, just, just like HPV and cervical cancer, similar concept. And, um, you know, we could prevent a lot of these morbidities and mortalities uh, if we can just prevent the cancers altogether. And I, I think I would love to just bring up again, I, I think the concept, uh, you know, if you're taking care of patients with head and neck cancer, it's an incredibly difficult treatment regimen to get through typically concurrent chemo radiation, um, as previously mentioned. And I think the whole concept of de-escalation of therapy and, and, and determining how do we make uh, more tolerable therapeutic um, strategies to, to allow patients to actually receive the full full treatment um, is, is so, so important. And something that I think in the field of oncology, we haven't spent nearly enough time thinking about over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. It's, it's always been adding one more therapy and trying to push people through. And I think it's finally uh, starting to um, you go the other direction in some ways. And I, I think you're seeing that with targeted therapies too. You know, we don't necessarily need to do dose escalation trials anymore. And the concept of a maximum tolerated dose doesn't necessarily have to be the end all to be all, you know, we can think about, you know, what's efficacious and, 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 and safe for the patient and tolerable. So, uh, all, all really great topics related to head and neck. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a tough disease. Yeah. Great point. Um, the survivorship is such a long journey for these individuals. Many of these individuals, um, some of them are very young, and um, um, there is 
you know, of course, one of the, the diseases that has the highest rates of depression uh, post-treatment. Survivorship is a complex issue. There's this, um, you know, dry mouth, that that whole complex, you know, dental issues subsequently. Uh, that That's one thing. And then, um, and, on, uh, and, and secondly, like I mentioned, you know, ongoing depression, continued use of uh, tobacco and alcohol is another area that, that, that needs attention because these individuals are at risk for developing other um, head and neck cancers or other cancers in other areas. Um, so all of these, and, and then we, we brought about low dose uh, CT uh, for individuals who have high risk for um, uh, thoracic malignancies. These are all topics that need to be focused in, in during survivorship. Um, I think, you know, the uh, utilizing um, primary care physicians as well as cancer comprehensivists, um, endocrinologists in many instances uh, due to thyroid, ongoing thyroid issues. These are all things that come up during survivorship, but it's a long journey. And I think, uh, you know, oncologists remain part of their journey throughout. Um, and, um, you know, I, I mean, that that something needs to really change because um, it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a long life uh, with, with suffering. I, these are really important points. You know, a lot of the viewers uh, listening to us today will have taken care of patients with head and neck cancers and know that the morbidity really is among one of the tougher ones in solid tumor oncology. So very important to know what resources are available to you, um, who to rely on in terms of both acute toxicities of treatment, but long-term toxicities as well in the survivorship phase. So call a friend if you need to, just make sure we can do the best for our patients. I, I think that's a nice take home point for our discussion today. Was there um, anything else the two of you wanted to add uh, before we wrapped up our conversation today? Um, no, I mean, I think it's uh, it's really, uh, uh, um, you know, the era of personalized treatment. Um, head and neck cancers are somewhat lagging behind other um, cancer types in advances, but they're catching up. Um, but I think, um, you know, in, infusion of some resources and some newer ideas into the head and neck arena would be extremely helpful in moving us forward in the same direction as all the other cancers have been. So thank you so much. Yes, yeah, this is great. I think that the last thing I would say is just, you know, once again, um, you know, trying to ensure people get HPV vaccines, discouraging people from uh, tobacco use, discouraging alcohol use or alcohol overuse. I mean, all very, very important things. I mean, the drug development is super interesting, but there's very, you know, easier ways we can prevent these cancers. So always important to bring up. Thank you both. I think those are two very important calls to finalize our discussion today. On one side, advocacy for funding and on the other side, advocacy for prevention. So thank you for, so much for sharing your thoughts today. We will go ahead and close out this episode of the Fellows Forum and we'll see you for the next one. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you.